Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode four of my series, The Formation of the United States of America, the Constitutional Convention. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, farmers in the backcountry of Massachusetts revolted in December 1786 after a wealthy speculator became governor and drastically increased taxes in order to pay off the state debt of notes issued during the war, which had been bought for a fraction of their value by a small number of speculators. The revolt was called Shays' Revolt after Daniel Shays, one of the main rebel leaders. Since most members of the state militia either refused to serve or join the rebels, the speculators and other wealthy businessmen financed a private army, which caught the rebels by surprise in early February, and most rebels simply returned home. While the revolt had been relatively bloodless, the failure of the militia to defeat the revolt made members of legislatures in other states reconsider the value of sending delegates to attend the convention in Philadelphia to discuss a stronger national government. While the convention would have definitely taken place even if Shay's revolt had not happened, it is debatable whether or not the convention would have had as many delegations without the recent fear of revolting peasants. More important, influential people now wanted to attend, and they had a goal, a powerful central government. Those influential people included George Washington, but he played coy, refusing to state whether or not he would attend the convention. So, James Madison and Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph lobbied him to attend. Still, he hesitated for two reasons. The convention had not been approved by Congress, and he did not want his prestige to be associated with the failure. Finally, Congress approved the convention, which removed one issue, and he gradually saw the need for a convention with bold goals. Before the Revolution, Washington was one of the leading men in Virginia, one of the largest colonies. After the Revolution, he was the leading man in the nation, towering over all rivals. Washington's prestige was matched only by Benjamin Franklin, who had lived abroad for most of the past three decades. Actually, Franklin had been added to the Pennsylvania delegation last simply because he was 81 years old and it was unclear if his health was sufficient. Even so, he was too weak to stand and address the chamber, so he usually asked his fellow delegate James Wilson to speak for him. Actually, it should not surprise that Franklin decided to attend despite his poor health, since he had been pushing for a union since the start of the Seven Years' War. In early 1754, he printed the famous editorial cartoon of a rattlesnake cut into pieces with the name of a colony on each severed part and the caption, Join or Die. Later that year, he joined delegates from seven middle and northern colonies at the Albany Congress, proposing a union where each colony handled internal affairs, but a president general appointed by the king would oversee a council of representatives from the various colonies. And this council would handle relations with the Native Americans, settlement of the West, and defense of the coast and the frontier, which would require the ability to pass laws and levy taxes. The proposal never won official support, but Franklin saw his last chance to fulfill his dream more than 30 years later. Aside from hosting the convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania's delegation would be the largest, with eight members, including Robert Morris, Gouverneur Morris, and James Wilson. The state delegations that arrived first, Virginia and Pennsylvania, represented two of the three largest states. Having lived in Paris, Franklin knew that good food and drink could break the ice among delegates who did not know each other, so he hosted a dinner for the two delegations. All seven members of Virginia's delegation knew each other well and all owned slaves. George Mason had left his comfortable plantation with 300 slaves to attend the convention out of a sense of duty and friendship with Washington, but he saw little need for major changes to the federal government. Washington and Mason had been friends and allies for decades, but they disagreed over the creation of a closer union. Mason's Declaration of Rights for Virginia in June 1776 had greatly inspired Thomas Jefferson's own Declaration of Independence a few weeks later, but Mason suffered from gout was a widower with nine children and simply did not want to leave his home, so he had stayed in Virginia throughout the Revolution and remained a Virginian afterwards. However, Washington had left Virginia at the start of the Revolution and had not returned until the end, becoming an American in the process. 
aside from Washington and Mason. The key members of Virginia's delegation were Governor Edmund Randolph and James Madison, who had represented Virginia during the brief Annapolis Convention. Coming of age during the Revolution, Madison had less attachment to Virginia and wanted a strong central government. However, he was less interested in democracy because he had a poor opinion of the state governments, which were democratically elected. He was not alone. Both Robert Morris and his protégé, Gouverneur Morris, were contemptuous of the growing democratic movement in New York and Pennsylvania. Since he had proposed the Philadelphia Convention, Madison intended to make sure that it succeeded, so he had arrived 11 days early and spent the time preparing his draft of a constitution. The convention was scheduled to commence on May 14th, but seven states, represented by at least half of their delegations, were required to achieve quorum. So days passed where the delegates would assemble, but adjourn after a quick head count revealed that the numbers were not enough. Actually, the delayed start of the convention was beneficial, since the delegations of Virginia and Pennsylvania bonded and drafted a plan for a national government. Most of the work was performed by Madison, Gouverneur Morris, and James Wilson. As a member of both the Continental Congress and the Confederation Congress, Wilson had tried to strengthen the powers of Congress. Led by John Rutledge, the South Carolina delegation was the third delegation to reach quorum. They were even more closely connected than the Virginia delegation. Charles Pinckney and Charles Coteworth Pinckney were first cousins. Pierce Butler's wife was the cousin of Charles Coteworth Pinckney's wife, while Rutledge's brother had married Pinckney's sister-in-law. With time on their hands, the members of the delegations explored Philadelphia, including attending a Catholic service, which seems inconsequential now, but was actually a big deal at the time. Catholics had been persecuted throughout the colonies before the Revolution as a side effect of Protestant England's war against Catholic France. Catholics could not vote or hold office in any of the colonies. These restrictions were weakened after the war, but there were still only 35,000 Catholics in the 13 states by the time of the convention. So the delegates accepted an invitation to attend Mass from the only Catholic delegate out of curiosity. The event received attention, especially when Washington attended Mass the following Sunday. He rarely attended church, so this sent a message of tolerance. The next four delegations to achieve quorum were New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and North Carolina. New York's legislature was not enthusiastic about a stronger federal government, so Robert Yates and John Lansing were selected to argue for states' rights. The third delegate was Alexander Hamilton, who firmly wanted a federal government. In fact, he had forged a close relationship with James Madison when they served together in the Continental Congress near the end of the war. Four of North Carolina's five delegates had arrived, which is impressive, given the distance especially when you compare it to New Jersey. Although located across the Delaware River, only three of New Jersey's five delegates had reached Philadelphia by May 25th, becoming the seventh delegation to achieve quorum. Although quorum was finally achieved on May 25th, delegates continued to arrive throughout June. Massachusetts achieved quorum a few days after the convention started, and the delegates from Connecticut showed up a week later. John Lansing of New York arrived a week after the convention started. Given Georgia's distance, it is not surprising that his delegation did not achieve quorum until June 11th. Why were so many delegates tardy, you ask? Heavy rains and poor roads were part of the problem, but there were other factors. Not every state was eager to send a delegation, and not every delegate was eager to attend. Governor Livingston of New Jersey arrived on June 5th, followed much later by fellow delegate Jonathan Dayton on June 28th. Rhode Island simply refused to participate, fearing that a strong central government would come at the expense of its own independence. Two delegates, one from Connecticut and one from Maryland, refused to attend due to Philadelphia's well-deserved reputation for yellow fever. Other delegates felt the convention was not important. Four of Maryland's first five delegates refused to go, preferring to stay at home to fight over paper currency. Five delegates were finally selected on May 26, but they lacked enthusiasm, so none attended the entire convention. In fact, one Maryland delegate, Daniel Carroll, stood out because he only arrived on August 6 and left 11 days later. Fortunately, Maryland was the only state that permitted its delegation to vote if a single delegate was present, possibly in recognition of the previously mentioned lack of enthusiasm. 
New Hampshire refused to pay the expenses of his delegates, so wealthy delegate John Langdon picked up the tab for himself and his fellow delegate Nicholas Gilman, but the delay resulted in their arrival in late July. Actually, the convention began to lose delegates even as other delegates were still arriving. The first delegate to leave was William Houston of New Jersey, who departed after a mere week because he was suffering from tuberculosis and would die within a year. He was followed soon after by Virginia delegate George Wythe, who left to care for his seriously ill wife. Although Philadelphia had a population of over 40,000 people, those people were mostly crammed into an area of eight square blocks, so it was loud and smelly. While the lack of proper sewers led to frequent outbreaks of gastro disease and the more serious yellow fever, it was also the most ethnically diverse city in the United States because it was a port city and many recent immigrants stayed in the city rather than move further into the new nation. Once the convention had barely achieved quorum, it could officially convene and prepare for the real work. Its first move was to appoint Washington as the convention's president. Washington embraced the position because he was able to remain silent except to call people to order, so he did not have to express any opinions, just sit on a platform above everyone else. Each delegation voted according to the majority will of his delegates. The convention met from 10 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon, six days a week. Despite the importance of the subject, the debates were closed off to visitors, no official notes were made, and the delegates were sworn to secrecy. The vow of silence regarding the proceedings of the convention was kept with impressive dedication. Delegates who left the convention and returned home maintained silence, but more important, none of the delegates gossiped even though they had vibrant social lives, which included a great deal of drinking. To be fair, the rule of secrecy enabled delegates to take positions or make proposals without fear of criticism from the people of the states that they represented. It may not have been very democratic, but it did prevent partisan grandstanding, so it fostered productive debates that helped build consensus. Strange as it may sound, Many leaders of the revolution did not participate in the convention. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were still in Europe. President of Congress during the signing of the Declaration of Independence, John Hancock, had been re-elected as governor of Massachusetts and was dealing with the aftermath of Shea's revolt. Although Patrick Henry had been nominated as a delegate, he had refused, preferring to deal with local issues following his retirement as governor rather than waste time haggling over minor changes to the Articles. John Jay had been president of the Continental Congress and had helped negotiate the treaty with England that ended the revolution, but was serving as Secretary of Foreign Affairs in the Confederation Congress. So, if the leaders of the revolution didn't attend, who were the delegates? The average age of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention was 44. The relative youth of many of the delegates reflected their position as members of wealthy families, and the fact that many important men had better things to do. Eight delegates had signed the Declaration of Independence, 35 had been officers in the Continental Army, and 42 had been in the Continental or Confederation Congress, so they were familiar with the weaknesses of the existing system. Five of the delegates were former aides of Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James McHenry, Thomas Mifflin, Charles Coteworth Pinckney, and Edmund Randolph. In theory, the debates were supposed to be recorded by the secretary, William Jackson, but he proved unequal to the task, accomplishing little other than recording the outcomes of votes, so it is impossible for later historians to accurately state what happened. Madison spent much of his spare time drafting a record of all the speeches made each day, but he was also busy preparing his own arguments, and he does not appear to have consulted with any other member to confirm the accuracy of his record. Moreover, he was not a trained stenographer, so he basically summarized the key points of other delegate speeches, so his notes are valuable, but not entirely reliable. Part of the problem of relying on Madison's notes is that he was naturally partisan. He backed the Virginia plan and it helped draft it, so he made notes on his introduction. Charles Pinckney of South Carolina presented another plan, but Madison merely wrote a few lines about the plan, so historians have naturally focused on the Virginia plan, even though Pinckney claimed to have contributed to the drafting of the Constitution. 
Actually, Pinckney's claim has some basis. As a member of the Confederation Congress, Pinckney had requested a convention to repair the defects of the Articles of Confederation, and he probably took part in discussions with delegates from Virginia and Pennsylvania since he had arrived early as well. In the end, he likely made a contribution greater than what Madison stated, but less than what he himself claimed. On May 29th, Edmund Randolph made a speech listing the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation and proposed a remedy to those defects, known as the Virginia Plan. It was drafted largely by Madison, but in consultation with the Virginia and Pennsylvania delegates as they waited for quorum. Randolph presented the plan because he was the governor of Virginia, the most powerful state in the Confederation, and he was a member of the state's most influential family. The plan advocated a legislature of two houses, like most states, with an executive and a judiciary. Representation in the new Congress would be decided by population, not allocated equally to states, thus ending the serenity of the states. The plan was revolutionary, because the new nation would be built on people rather than a collection of states. The popularly elected first branch of the legislature would then select the second branch, and the two branches would choose the executive and appoint the judges. The limited involvement of the population in elections reflected the distaste of the plan's advocates for democracy. In fact, Randolph complained that the various state constitutions had failed to provide sufficient checks against democracy. Basically, state legislatures were too representative of ordinary people. This speech was the first admission that some delegates wanted to replace the Articles of Confederation with a new constitution. Many delegates had thought that they would merely revise existing articles, not create an entirely new constitution. The rule of secrecy held since none of the delegates sent messages back to their respective legislatures asking for new instructions, which would have been understandable because the mission of the convention had changed completely. To sum up, although it took time for enough delegations to reach quorum, when the convention officially started, Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph proposed the Virginia Plan, which was a radical plan since representation in the new Congress would be decided by population, not allocated equally to states. So, the delegates would debate a new constitution. Basically, they would debate whether or not to create a new country. So the question is, what kind of government would that country have? And I will discuss the debate over the future government next episode. Thanks for listening.